The stewards of the FIA have adjudged that this part of Gareth Jones on Speed has unfairly come in front of the rest of the show and, as a result, are adding 25 seconds to it. Why not use this time to reflect on why motorsport is being ruined by a bunch of mad old men? Hello, welcome once again to Gareth Jones on Speed. Zog and Richard are with me here today. Hi, fellows. Hello there. Did you enjoy that fantastic race in Monza? It was quite something, wasn't it, eh? Fantastic stuff. Really, really exciting. And um, what a tremendous first win that was, wasn't it, Richard? Oh, yeah, as first wins go, really, really quite amazing. Yeah, I mean, Dalvid Velsaki, just fantastic, you know. Was I know, I think he's really stamped his mark on GP2 there. And, I mean, it's quite interesting because I suppose... It's Shame the Senna didn't get it, but then the championship's already to be honest, done and dusted. To be honest, I was and, um, the now, you may have noticed that we're not really actually really talking really about that well, fantastic first win in Monza that everyone else is talking about. Yeah, yeah. But we will be talking yeah. about Sebastian yeah. Vettel's yeah. amazing yeah. first win yeah. a little bit later. Yeah. But first, yeah. this. Gardening Hour. Hello, and welcome to Gardening Hour with me, P.T. Loam. I'm joined, as ever, by our resident West Country gardening expert, Jensen Button, a man who's certainly had his fair share of earth dreams. Hello. And Jensen, our first letter is from Mary, who's in St Albans. She says, I planted some sweet peas earlier in the year, and I'm sad to say I've seen nothing from them. Is it because I planted them right at the back of my garden? Well, it's, uh, it's not an uncommon problem there, Jensen. Uh, no, uh, definitely not. I don't know about you, but I'd say the real problem here is uh, the location in the garden. You know, being right at the back is pretty much next to useless, and you're never going to see any meaningful results there. Quite honestly, you might as well just give up. What? Yet all you'll ever see, really, is a bit of an embarrassment. Isn't that so, Jensen? Um, well, I... I, I, d- d- I mean, you're always going to be overshadowed by faster-growing, more determined... Are we still talking about gardening? Yes, I was just saying that basically being stuck at the back is really just for dismal little weeds. What? And that reminds me of a letter we've had from Jeff, who's in Kettering. He says his family were looking forward to the warmer months and lots of lovely fresh vegetables from their allotment, but it really hasn't worked out for him. I'm sure we can all relate to this, Jensen. The season is almost over, and he's seen no results at all. That's a terrible one, isn't it, Jensen? I I, I am... uh, uh... I mean, that must be immensely depressing, and I suppose he wonders if he's just completely wasted everyone's time with absolutely sod all to show for it. Listen, it's not my fault. What isn't, Jensen? Sorry, I I was thinking of something else. Okay. Uh, Shall we move on to another letter? Uh, And this one's from Janet, who's in uh, Bury St Edmunds. I planted some chrysanthemum seedlings and left them on the windowsill of my kitchen, which faces south, she says. This led to an argument with my brother William, who said he should put them in his kitchen window, which faces west. I refused, but now I'm regretting it because the seedlings have wilted. That's an interesting question there, Jensen. Would it have been better if they'd gone to William's? Oh, God! I mean, it can't have been any more awful. Not any worse than the limp, dismal, rather pathetic and barely noticeable effort that... Stop it! Stop it! Please! What? What? Jensen? Well, uh, listeners, uh, ever the resourceful gardener, uh, Jensen is now watering some of the plants we've got here in the studio with his eyes. Very ecological. And that's all we've got time for. Uh, coming up next on Radio Sleep, Home Movie and Production Masterclass with Max Mosley. Good night. I want to go back to my yacht. Definitely. Gardening Hour. Stick Federal! We Gareth Jones on speed! This 2008 Formula One season is another blinder, really. I mean, apart from the controversy way back at Spa, that was a great race with a great ending. I can't remember jumping up and down on my sofa more. But actually, I was jumping up and down on my sofa at the Monza race as well, and very worried for Lewis. Although it did look like he might have snatched something quite special just at the end there, but uh, wasn't to be. Well, yeah, I know if you looked at it on paper, you'd say, well, he qualified badly, tired, problems, la, la, la. And then in the race, you know, he finished just in the points. But I think that would overlook the performance that he gave in the middle bit of the race. Yeah. Which was another storming thing. There was an in-car shot they showed on the TV coverage 
when it was really streaming the road, and you could barely see from a lot of those in-car cameras, but it just cleared enough to see how much the car was moving around and therefore how much he was fighting it to keep it on the track. And he was absolutely on the ragged edge. And then you looked at the people that he was supposedly sort of fighting with, not least for the championship, Massa and, and Raikkonen particularly... Where were they? Well, Raikkonen did is, they do? I mean, he did something astonishing in the middle part of that race. Raikkonen is the interesting comparison, I think, because they both started way back in the pack, whereas Lewis managed to make some real progress through the field. If the track had stayed wetter at the end of the race, yeah. you know, he he would have been first or second. Mm. I reckon they had Wincy Willis doing the weather forecasting. She was never terribly good on <laughs> TV AM. And they said it was going to rain, and it didn't. And that really would have sorted it for Lewis. And well, he goes into the next race... Uh, what one point ahead of Massa at the moment? That's just great. That's what you want, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, and we go into a night race. <sighs> I'm excited. Mean, that's, that's, yeah, yeah. Interesting. I, 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 if someone was writing a script for this season, they couldn't have done it much better. We're not going to go into the whole Lewis penalty controversy because there's just far no. too much to talk about there. Oh. And all kinds of things. Although I think actually some things that we might have said about it wouldn't have been as predictable as. You might think. But <laughs> anyway, so can I just ask is, you to take your hand off the lid of the can of worms? Okay, yeah, <laughs> leave it. Leave it. No, away from the can. But okay. you know the but, rest. No, no, but, 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 so, sorry. Go on, Zach. The, the thing is, what was the thing? Um, hang on. <laughs> <laughs> after Spa, after the the Lewis row had blown up immediately, I noticed that there was a story about how the FIA were taking a look at Massa's engine. They were mm. doing this thing that they do. Yeah, yeah. You know, they, they'd they'd seal they the do engines. random checks on yeah. various cars throughout the season. Yeah, yeah check the engines. Yeah. You know, you can get just like, just like you get a you know a drugs test if you're in a big athlete. You might get a an engine check if you're if you're a Formula One. Car. It's, it's a bit like the police stopping you. It's, it's a way away. Have you stopped me? It's just a routine check, sir. We just want to look inside your engine, Mister yeah. Massa. Well, it's like customs. I, They're checking he hasn't got fags and a bottle of gin stuffed in one of the cylinders. <laughs> but the thing is, I couldn't help thinking that somebody who was a little bit more cynical than me might have just seen it as a possible way that somebody was finding behind the scenes to balance out what they might have decided was a mistake in penalising Lewis. Unless they wanted to... If for the uh, sake of argument you, you, you wanted to take Massa's points away at that race yeah. having decided that the Lewis penalty was a disaster albeit they couldn't then just overturn it because yes. that would look too bad for the stewards well what do you do? You decide that Massa's car has been illegal, uh, you disqualify it and, and therefore you, 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 know, you, you negate the advantages that you then gave to Massa Unless it's possible they were just wanted to look inside the Ferrari engine to find out what they were playing at because frankly it, that car, a- particularly when it rains really seems to go off. Yeah, yeah, with Massa Really it. goes off, yeah. with Massa in it particularly. But, I mean, Kimmy's not been having off. a brilliant time either. And no, it's just, true. I don't know whether really you got to that point in the season where they've stopped all development on the 2008 car, essentially, like, apart from basics, because they're all focused on the 2009, on the 2009 cars. Yeah. Speaking of I which... I bet Ferrari still developing that 2009 strange thing, like that, a strange small story that appeared in the news uh, a few weeks ago is that Ferrari have got a new simulator at the factory... For, uh, I guess for the drivers to learn tracks or something. I thought they used PlayStation for that, but they've got this new yeah, state of the art well. yes. yeah. Oh, do they? Yeah. But is, there's, is McLaren's built, as Ferrari's is, by Moog, or is it Moog? It's Mo- Moog, 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 we say. Most, right. Moog. most people say Moog synthesizers, but it's Moog synthesizers. Yeah, right, because it's M O O G. And well, it's built by it. Moog, is it? The Ferrari simulator is built <laughs> by Moog. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, we're here in Maranello, and uh, yes, I understand Ferrari are about to turn on their new Moog simulator for the first time. Tutti pronti? Bravo. Aviaro del simulatore. Right. Um, <laughs> this is a bit weird. Um, to explain a, a little more of what's going on, I'm joined by Ferrari's head of production, Dr. Brian Eno. I used to be in Roxy Music, you know. This, this is, um, uh, this is strange and horrible. Um, can you make it stop? I invented ambient music, I did. All on my own. No, please, God, just stop it. Stop it now. Stop. And I've got Bono's mobile phone number, the one he actually answers... Hello, Brian, he says. Hello, Bono, I say back. Just make this stop. That Windows startup music? I wrote that. Make it stop! There, I've turned it off. No, no you haven't. What's this hideous dull monotone? Mm. 
Ah, that. I think Kimi Raikkonen's giving an interview in the next room. Gareth Jones on speed. Gareth Jones on speed. Gareth Jones on speed. Gareth Jones on speed. Guys, I've been thinking, do you know the regulation change that they've now <coughs> clarified? Mm. That if you gain an advantage by cutting a chicane, you then have to allow the person that you pass to come past you and then go round one more corner before you're allowed to overtake them again. Yeah. I reckon this could lead to some kind of clever strategy towards the end of the season. Imagine if you're racing with someone for the championship and you think right there's no way I can beat them on the circuit he's right on top of me mm. what you do is you force them into that situation <laughs> yes. right force them to go wide on the chicane yeah yeah, the yeah, chicane. yeah yeah and then when they slow down to let you pass into the lead again you slow down too so they remain in the lead as you approach the next corner and they get a penalty okay you're then going to have the sight of two formula 1 cars sort of driving around like something out of wacky races or driving the wrong way around the circuit trying not to overtake each other. Isn't I... that what goes on at the moment anyway? Boom, boom. Uh, now, uh, if you've been to a Formula One race this year, as we have, uh, you've probably read the Red Bulletin F1, which is a free magazine or newspaper, you might say, which is published four times over the weekend. And they do this whole thing from a truck, which they park at the race. Now, when we were at Silverstone, Zog and I spent some time in the Red Bulletin truck talking to the people there to find out how they do it. And so I thought I'd put it to their publisher, Norman Howell. How on earth do you go about publishing a Formula One newspaper from a truck at an F1 race? You've got some kit here. I'm standing in what looks like a full newspaper print operation. It's a couple of trucks, isn't it? Yeah, we have two trucks, two 38-ton trucks, and the truck you're standing in now is our main working truck. It has 7.5 tons of uh, Heidelberg printer and collating machine. So this is pucker printing. This is, as you say, like a newspaper, only in obviously a smaller version. The truck opens hydraulically. So it creates two offices for our 30 staff here. And the second truck is a complete support truck with kitchen and uh, meeting rooms. and Very luxurious. Essentially, we publish four editions every weekend. Uh, Friday morning, Saturday morning, and two on a Sunday. And the second on a Sunday is within an hour of the race. So that's, uh, that's quite tight. And, of course, we have web here too. So what's the biggest problem of trying to do this sort of thing on location? Power, you know, setting up the truck level? Truck level is a big issue. Uh, our master printer uh, wants it to be uh, within a tolerance of 0.5 of a millimetre. No. So uh, it gets a bit exciting as some of the more uh, interesting races. It, <laughs> so uh, these are big trucks to, to level out. So that takes a time. It takes, some, takes our rigs about a day to build it completely and, and a day to dismantle them completely. So it's quite a big job. When our journalists come in on a, on a Thursday morning, first thing, 8 o'clock, everything is set up. All the computers, all the Macintoshes, all the printers, everything is absolutely set up. So they just sit down. And they, all they've got to do is work. Does it always work? Uh, always has, actually, so far. We've had interesting moments, but we've always got the magazines out. It's Catherine Shaw. I'm the deputy picture editor for the Red Bulletin F1 magazine. Catherine, any magazine revolves on not just the words, but the pictures. Often the pictures get people's attention before the words. How difficult is it to get pictures for the Red Bulletin? Because we're working live on the day of the race, it can be quite difficult. Some sections we make during the week, so obviously that's already on the page when we get here, but live pictures, it's pretty intense, and I'm often emailing at the last minute going, please, somebody, has anybody got this shot from a certain angle? I know that the photographers run back to the media centre as soon as the race is finished and start uploading, so it's quite hectic. I did have somebody come in yesterday who's a fan. A lot of people have got sort of professional cameras now, Somebody came in yesterday and he was the only one who'd got Massa crashing in practice. And we took his picture and we've printed it and we've paid him for it. And he was cool. really chuffed. Yeah, often that happens, yeah. So if you're out of race and you do catch something... If it's something good, yeah, have a go, because we might need it. <laughs> uh, just looking at on your monitor now, on your screen save, you've got some lovely candid shots of the Ferrari pit crew, Kimmy sitting on the flight cases and stuff. 
Mm. Is that really what you're after? Is it, is it more reportage or is it, are you looking for really silly photos? Because the attitude of the Red Bulletin is damn funny, isn't it? Yeah, it is. We have different features for different things. So um, the front section is mainly news because it's the last thing that goes in the day. So we wait till the end of the day till things have happened and then we can show you what happened in that day. And also we have a thing called Bullseyes, which is funny things that happen in the paddock. And then we write funny captions to them. Because often there's lots and lots of pictures of people with funny expressions or drivers picking the noses and things like that. We like that. <laughs> yeah, we like what, to embarrass people. So what, what's, your, what, what's your favourite or rudest picture, or you know, the naughtiest picture, cheekiest um, picture you've ever published? What would it be? I think this year it's got to be Lewis Hamilton. Um, he went and did Troy, the, a play. Yeah, and um, he was sort of hanging from a... Uh, what do you call it? A uh, Kirby wire is actually yeah, they call it. Yeah, and we had to airbrush a certain part of his anatomy because it was a little bit... What's the word? <laughs> Scrunch, obvious or scrunched up. Yeah. I've worn Kirby wires, and the trouble is you have to wear a five-point harness, and what that does is cram any tackle you may yeah. have into a very small area, and yeah. it does make it look a bit more pronounced. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. we airbrushed it for the sake of Lewis's modesty. You're not just journalists, but you're gentlemen and ladies too. We are. You know, we, we like to poke fun, but we don't want to be too cruel. Have you ever had something that you'd love to use that just haven't been able to use? Yeah, all the time. We've only got 24 pages, so we can't fit everything in. But now we've got the website. That means we can have more galleries on there. It's yeah. growing. We're going to see more of your pictures, aren't we? Yep. Justin Hines, I'm the editor. Justin, you've got the pressure job, I think, here, haven't you? Surely, because you've got to make some pretty rapid decisions in publishing. And when you're out on location and the pressure's on to publish something, mm -hmm. you're going to feel it, aren't you? How difficult is it? It's difficult sometimes when things happen really late in the day and we're on quite a tight deadline to get uh, everything to our printers, which are here in our office. And to get everything done at the last minute is a bit difficult. But that's part of the game. It's part of the fun of doing it, is making those decisions really quickly and getting as much live content as you possibly can into it. So how, how do you get that live content? You know, How many reporters have you got and who are you talking to? And what sort of restrictions have you got? We've got two staff reporters who work for us all the time and they're constantly back and forth in the paddock just trawling for bits and pieces, getting whatever stories. We've got uh, photographers, uh, one staff photographer and everybody else just contributes whatever they can to us. What's been your sort of biggest success? Have you managed to break news while you're here? We had great stuff last year. When Lewis crashed at the Nürburgring, we were the only magazine to get pictures of that crash. It's a great environment to do it because we get out earlier than anybody else can. Aside from, like, obviously, television and radio, we just have the ability to react quicker on stories like last year when there was a whole McLaren thing. What's in the magazine and the website this weekend so far? Well, so far we've had uh, David announcing his retirement, uh, which happened on Thursday afternoon, so we had that as a big story on Friday. Obviously the move to Donington in 2010, which came as a bit of a shock to everybody yesterday morning. The main things for us, the big features we've had, and we've got a big one in tomorrow about Formula One's little secret society of poker players amongst the drivers, which is great because we, we got them together to play poker in the Red Bulls Energy Station for a special poker game with Nick and Giancarlo, Tony O'Leary, and uh, Timo Glock. We also had a massive thing about Kimi this morning and all of Kimi's toys about how you know he bought Sharon Stone's Corvette yeah. and how he loves skidoo racing and playing hockey and motorcycles. The thing we do is try and give it a different take and if we concentrate on Kimi we'd like to know a bit more about Kimi and present it in a bit more of a light-hearted way. Get inside people's heads in the paddock and not present them as just you know world-class racing drivers but what makes them tick as well how do you do that how do you get inside a racing driver's head it's notoriously difficult i've interviewed racing yeah. drivers it's tough how do you do it it's difficult I think, I think it's because of the platform that we have it's now a, a kind of a traditional part of everybody's breakfast reading in the paddock so you put out the magazines in the morning everybody picks up their copy and they're willing to let you in a little bit more than if it was somebody from the outside coming in so we're almost like the Paddock's Village Gazette. <laughs> so when, when you get to that stage, then people sort of trust you. They know that you're not going to take advantage of them and that you're just going to have some fun with them, and it's gentle fun. Being associated with Red Bull, yeah. does that, obviously that works for you as far as mm. Toro Rosso and the Red Bull racing teams are concerned. Does it work against you with the other teams? Has it in the past? No, not really, no. We sort of treat everybody equally. You know, We'll do good things for everybody. We'll knock everybody occasionally as well and have a bit of fun with them. But it's never malevolent or malicious. You must have upset someone along the way. Who's been the most upset so far? We upset lots of people. <laughs> but most of the time we just upset the publisher. <laughs> <laughs> Formula One is notoriously litigious and yeah. notoriously carefully managed by uh, Mr Ecclestone. Yes. Have you ever clashed with Bernie? No. 
I think he likes what we do because it gives a different take and it makes it feel like a place that has a sense of humour and doesn't take itself massively seriously sometimes. It's obviously a very serious endeavour, but at the same time it can sort of poke fun at itself and have a bit of a laugh along the way. Sounds a little bit like Gareth Jones on speed. Justin, thank you very much indeed. Thanks a lot. Red Bulletin, of course, report from every Formula One race. And, in fact, I have a whole bunch of people at Monza. And just after the race, I got on the phone and spoke to their chief writer, Adam Hay Nichols, to ask him what was going on after the race. Sebastian Vettel said his second taste of champagne today because uh, he was given another bottle. And it will be the first of many tonight, I'm sure, to spray all over the race mechanics. That must be a great place to be. Yeah, I mean, the atmosphere is fantastic. It's such a popular win because Sebastian is a lovely chap. He's got to made history by becoming the youngest winner ever. And everybody's absolutely thrilled for him, really. Across Formula One, every team, uh, everybody's been coming up and congratulating him and congratulating his family and uh, everyone close to him. That's unusual because usually when there's a winner in Formula One, that means that there's, what, 19 losers. And so most people have got a very hangdog expression. The reward for this team is tremendous. It's greater than any. I don't know how many races Minardi had without a win, but Toro Rosso seemed to have done it. And they've done it really quite quickly. Yeah? They've done it in two and three quarters of a season. And, of course, Minardi has been around for a long time before. I can't remember exactly off the top of my head how many uh, Grand Prix Minardi did. But they did so without a single race win, and they've gone and done it today. And a lot of the people that are in the uh, Toro Rosso team have been with Minardi before it. Some of them have been at that team for 25 years. And so it's a hell of a day. I'm sure that there'll be parties in Faenza as we speak where the team are from. How much of the success of Toro Rosso... Do you put down to the fact that Giorgio Ascanelli is now with the team? He was brought in by Gerhard Berger. He's got a great track record from his years at McLaren. And there seems to be a massive turnaround this year. I mean, do you think he's a big player in their success? Yeah, he's very successful at what he does because Ascanelli was at McLaren when they were at perhaps their most successful in the period of Prost and Senna and, of course, Gerhard Berg, which is where Gerhard knows him from. So they've got a very good relationship, and Ascanelli is a kind of no-nonsense bloke, and he seems to have gelled with the team very well, and everybody really respects him. It seems to me that this is more than just a lucky win. They certainly had the quickest car in qualifying, and they made it stick, as it were, in the race. Vettel seems to be an extraordinary talent, then. Well, he is. I think we've seen that on a number of occasions in the last 12 months. We saw at the end of last year where he went and got that magnificent fourth place in China in also very challenging circumstances. It's very rare that he puts a foot wrong in the wet. Most famously, he did put a foot wrong in in Japan last year when uh, he managed to take Mark Webber. But he he did so well to get up there anyway. So he really is a rainmaster, and that's a term that Lewis Hamilton uh, receives a lot. But he really is. And the other thing is that I don't think anybody expected Toro Rosso to go and win this weekend. And they won it on merit. I mean, you know, they didn't put a foot wrong. But there was a feeling within the team coming to Monza that if they were going to get on the podium, then this was the race that they were going to do it on because it's a track that suits the car very well with its long straights. And because Toro Rosso have got a Ferrari engine, uh, which is considered to be the most powerful, it was known that they were going to be very quick on the, on the straights. And if they were going to make a decent points haul, it was going to be at Monza, their home track. What does this mean for Red Bull, though? They must be in two minds, because in some ways, part of the Red Bull empire is doing very well, but perhaps not the part that they might have expected to be doing so well. That's true. Toro Rosso is seen as being the junior team, they don't quite have the same resources as the Red Bull Racing team, but essentially they have the same technical package, the difference being the engine. And in the second half of the season, it's been quite evident that the Ferrari engine has been superior to the Renault. Also, RBR did make a a bit of a step backwards in the second half of this season because they were trying out a few aerodynamic things which didn't really work for them. And they actually reverted back to the old package at Spa. And we actually saw at Spa and also at Monza with Weber that their pace is is pretty respectable. But Toro Rosso has certainly um, taken advantage of that extra power. Ultimately, though, Red Bull must be 
feeling rather pleased with themselves. They've had Coulthard, who's done a sterling job for them for a number of years now, but they're getting Vettel next season. That must be a shot in the arm. They're actually thrilled about it. I mean, people were asking Vettel there in a press conference, you know, are you sure you want to go there because the Toro Rosso is so good at the moment? I think that he and Weber are going to make an awesome partnership and we wait to see who the drivers are going to be at Toro Rosso. But also the Red Bull Racing crew were just as thrilled for Sebastian and everybody else. And so it's one big family, really, and both teams will be out partying. Tonight. And will you be at that party yourself? It's actually uh, Giancarlo Pisichella's manager's birthday, so I was going to that party anyway, and now I'm going to have to alternate between the two. But they're deciding at the moment where we're going to go, and that's the big decision that everybody's waiting for now. Last weekend, everybody was waiting to hear the stewards' decision over Hamilton, and now everybody's waiting here to see what the decision is going to be from the marketing department as where we go and get uh, drunk tonight. An extended version of that interview can be heard on the Red Bulletin website. Follow the link on garethjones.tv. Seriously, guys, don't you wish you were there in Monza for that party? Where would you go? Would you go to Giancarlo Fisichella's manager's party or would you go to the Sebastian Vettel party? Your choice. Oh, the Vettel party. Vettel <laughs> party. As well. Unless it turns out we've not been paying attention and Giancarlo Fisichella is managed by, I don't know, Elton John. Because, <laughs> yeah, you know, they'd put on a good bash. But even yeah. then, I think I'd probably go to the Vettel party, is, to be more it, honest. Any Irvin's old manager who manages... Uh, I'm not sure if it's one of the same. It? it might be, yeah. Really? I wanted oh, to okay. check that. We'll find out more. But... Uh, <laughs> Fizzy, Fizzy just fell off, didn't he? he? Nerfed the back of Coulthard at Monza, and that was it. Another excuse not to complete the race in, in a Force India. Jones, have you been listening to that Brundle nerfed? Oh, nerfed. yes, he does say nerf a lot. Oh, no, it's it, it, gone it, into my brain. It is a Brundle. No. I love it. I, I, just, I don't mind nerf because, A, it's not coming out of James Allen's mouth, and, B, it, does, <laughs> it sounds quite soft and gentle. Like, oh, we've just got some new kittens. Oh, what sort are they? They're Siamese. No, they're nerfs. And it's just a little <laughs> ball of fluff. And ah, like ah, a triple. Listen, yeah. listen. I don't know if anyone else listening to this at the moment was watching the ITV coverage like we were. Did you notice on Brundle's grid walk where he bumped into Bernie Eccleston? Oh. What did Bernie say to Brundle? Can you remember? I think he said, are you still with ITV? Yes, he did. Do yes, you think he was it. implying something? Well, I wonder whether he was, and then I, I didn't know whether it was just a dig at ITV. But um, simultaneously, my girlfriend and I, who were watching it together whilst making some toast cheese sandwiches, said, um, God, Bernie Eccleston's a right old b****, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I just read it as a bit, as, as a bit of stirring, as a bit of sort of yeah, you know, I know, poking but ITV he's, and a bit of... I thought he was he just, alluding... I'm just go over here and say something. Yeah. God, he's a nasty little b****. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was actually alluding to the fact that Brundle may have been picked up by the BBC. That's yeah, saying I, still I without... a, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wouldn't that be good news, though? And it'd be typical of Bernie to break it, wouldn't it? <laughs> or to hint at it. It'd be great. It's not the first thing it's broken. <laughs> uh, I, th- I think there are probably more reliable sources than what Bernie Eccleston hints at on a, yeah. on a grid walk. But listen, we've, we've pretty much heard what everyone agrees on Vettel winning. Uh, fantastic driver, very cool young guy, Toro Rosso. They won it, like we said on merit didn't they the other great thing is to me is that we've got really good drivers coming through at mm. a decent rate now you know in the sort of post Schumacher era if you like yeah. you know we've gone from Alonso being the guy who was challenging and beating Schumacher at the same time that Kimi was also there and thereabouts mm. and challenging and one of the other guys who clearly was about to win a world championship no sooner has Kimi managed to come in and win his world championship than Lewis is the next man and we're all saying that you know Kubica is going to be a champion yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in this couple of years you know and then already Vettel's popping up and the guy is fantastic so Perfect. why on earth do you need stupid F2 I mean, they're just going to be driving around in Audi A2s, aren't they, or something? Or old <laughs> old Audi Foxes or something. You've heard about this. It's such a cheap formula. And they're saying drivers will earn their super licence from this and go into Formula One. I think we've already got enough formulae which are doing that at the moment. I don't think there's space for F2. I really don't. But, hey, that's just me. But um, we mentioned some great drivers who have come from GP2 and have broken their way in. Uh, Vettel wasn't in GP2. He's in there. And here's my tip for GP2 for next year, right? I'm mm. Zog, you're a betting man. I'm not, but I'm going to put money on this. OK. In this case, it sounds like I better get my, get my wallet out. and. Uh... <laughs> Nico Hulkenberg, right, mm-hmm. who we know who did so very well for Team Germany, won the A1 GP Championship a couple of years back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he's doing marvellous business in Euro F3 at the moment, probably going to win the championship. I reckon he'll get a GP2 drive next year, and I reckon he'll win it. Now... 
what sort of odds would I... He hasn't even got a GP2 drive yet. Yeah. What odds would I get? Could If I put 100 quid on it, could I make 20 grand? Because I'm serious. I, I, I'm going to do it. Okay, so let me get the facts straight here. He doesn't have a drive yet in GP2. Correct. And you want to put a bet on him winning next year's... Yep. Championship. I'll put 100 quid on it. It's a funny one because you, you wouldn't be able to sort of place a normal bet. You're going to have to find a bookie who's going to make a special bet for you. Mm. You know, it's like going to bookies, bookies and saying, uh, I'd like to put a place a bet on finding Elvis in the uh, pie and mash place round the corner sometime in the next three weeks. He, he's working you know, in the chip shop at my place. Mm. Well, the bloke who works bloke down the chip, chip shop, shop reckons he's yeah, Elvis. Yeah. 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 Sorry. But, <laughs> Good Kirsty McCall reference. Um, you know, the, 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 they're going to they're have to figure out the odds specially uh, and right. you know, make that bet for you. So, I don't know. It, uh, it, and they're not going to be, you know, they may decide they don't want to take the bet because they, they, they might think you look like somebody who's got some inside information. Right. Well, and, do you know and, what and, and, and that you know he's got a drive. And that, right. Do you know what I mean? He so, hasn't. Uh, but, you know, the only information I've got, the only inside information I've got, Nico Hulkenberg's manager is Willy Weber. And if Willy Weber, former Michael Schumacher and Ralph's manager, if Willy Weber wants to get a GP2 drive for anyone, he can, no problem. Uh, but that's next year in the year beyond. For the moment, uh, let us salute Sebastian Vettel. Yay. And, uh, and also the Minardi, as I prefer to call them, or Toro Rosso team as they are these days, and we'll play out on the Toro Rosso anthem. Say goodbye, fellas, or say ciao, if you like. Ciao, bella. Ciao, bella. Luigi, Martini, Andrea, Di Cesaris, Alessandro, Nanini, Adrian Campos, Luis Perez, Ala, Paolo, Barilla, Gianni, Movidelli. Roberto Moreno, Christian Fittipaldi, Alessandro Zanardi, Jean Macunon, Fabrizio Barbaza, Michele Alvareto, Luca Badoa, Pedro Lavi, Giancarlo Fisichello, Tarso Marquez, Giovanni Lavaghi, Arno Trulli, Ukyo Katsuyama, Shinji Nakano, Esteban Chuero, Stefano Balazan, Marciane, Gasta Mazzacane, Alex Jung, Fernando Alonso, Anthony Davidson, Mark Webber, Justin Wilson, Nicholas Chiesa, Jos Verstappen. Gian Maria Bruni, Zalt Baumgartner, Christian Albers, Patrick Fieseker, Robert Dombos, Antonio Liuzzi, Scott Spitz, Sebastian Borde, Sebastian Vettel, Tony Liuzzi, Scott Speed, Sebastian Borde, Sebastian Vettel, Tony Liuzzi, Scott Speed, Sebastian Borde, and Sebastian Vettel. A scrivere la mostra on speed at garethjones.tv Abbonarsi gratuitamente presso iTunes Store Gareth Jones a velocità e fatto di whiz bang. Yeah.